welcome to smart catalyst december 19 2018 so today we are going to see all these articles the first one is kerala's captive jumbos get genetic ids the second one is bolstering paris the third one is center drafts child protection policy the fourth one is center urged to bring back restricted area permits in six andaman and nicobar islands and the fifth one is pm asha scheme and the sixth one is national e vidhan application project and the seventh one is focused retention for development of north east region and the last one is fidf fund so the first article is kerala's captive jumbos get the genetic ids so the news here is the kerala government recently announced that every one of the kerala's captive elephants now is going to have an unique dna based genetic id so who is assigned with this task in the sense rgcb which is Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotech okay Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotech and it is only given the task of dna fingerprinting of the elephants by means of using its dungs or tusk samples etc and after collecting the dna fingerprinting of the elephants it is handing over the data to the dna database also the prototypes of the unique identification cards are made for such captive elephants and finally a study report is submitted to the forest department by this rgcb so now we have to know what this captive elephant means so those elephants that have been captured from the wild and used by the humans so those are the captive elephants okay so now the forest department provide the blood samples of the captive elephants from across the state to the rgcb for dna fingerprinting so dna fingerprinting means it is a forensic technique that make it possible to identify individuals based on their unique dna characteristics called microsatellites so these microsatellites are uh, the dna portions that occur repeatedly and it is much like fingerprints and each and every dna microsatellites are unique for each and every individual so we can easily identify each and every individual including both the people as well as the animals okay so why they are doing this dna fingerprint in the sense in order to solve the wildlife crimes which is majorly affecting its population as well as to curb the poaching and illegal trading of the elephants so why elephants in the sense there are nearly 30000 elephants spread all across the country in nearly 16 states and maximum number of elephants is in kerala and followed by karnataka and assam so in 2010 elephants have been declared actually as a national heritage animal and if you see in 1992 project elephant has been launched as a centrally sponsored scheme in order to protect the population of elephant as well as conservation of the elephants under this project elephant there are three major objectives the first one is to protect the elephants their habitat as well as their corridors so habitat in the sense elephant reserves so if you see in our country there are nearly 28 elephant reserves covering 58000 square kilometer which is notified by all the state governments and out of this 28 elephant reserves maximum number of elephant reserve is in assam and in odisha so both of these states have like five elephant reserves each so similarly corridors means there are nearly 183 elephant corridors all across the country so what is this corridor means it is a narrow strip of land that allows the elephant to move from one habitat to another habitat this is the corridor right so in this there are uh, state elephant corridor interstate elephant corridor and international elephant corridors and meghalaya is having maximum number of state elephant corridors and jharkhand and odisha is having interstate maximum number of interstate elephant corridors and if you see in international elephant corridors india shares maximum with bangladesh okay so state interstate and international corridors so the next major objective is to address the issues of man animal conflict as well as for ensuring the welfare of the captive elephants so how they are going to meet this objectives in the sense they provide i mean under this project elephant they are going to provide financial and technical support to major elephant bearing states in the country for protection of elephants their habitats and corridor they are basically providing fund and it also ensure some steps thereby it can address the issues of the man animal conflict as well as the welfare of the domesticated elephant so the next article is bolstering paris the unfccc cop24 has got over last week 
and in that they actually came up with a rule book for the proper implementation of the Paris Agreement of 2015. So though it actually showcases certain kind of progress, but it actually doesn't adequately reflect the challenge which is posed by the global warming or the climate change. That means the outcome of this COP24 doesn't adequately reflect the short window available to make deep greenhouse gas emission cuts. So what the news here is, according to the IPCC report, to cap the rise in global average temperature at 1.5 degrees Celsius over the pre-industrial level, at least 45% reduction in emission should be made over the 2010 levels within the year 2030. And it should be done by all the countries including both the developed and the developing countries. So this 45% reduction by the countries are actually a major challenge especially for bigger economies including India because we are the top five emitters of carbon dioxide and we all know that as developed as well as the developing countries so as they are heavily industrialized they tend to release more carbon dioxide so it is a bigger challenge for the bigger economies so what needs to be done here in order to achieve the estimated target in the sense we should shift our focus from the non-renewable energy towards the renewable energy such as the solar power, wind power also in line with the goal of achieving that 175 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2022 aim. So we should steadily reducing the reliance of coal and fossil fuels kind of non-renewable energy and shift substantially to electric mobility and also we have to adopt green industrial processes thereby we can mitigate the emission of the greenhouse gases. And one more thing we can do here is we can tax the luxury emissions and the money that we get from here we can use that in order to give the poor the energy access. So these could be the potential way in order to achieve the estimated target. So apart from all these kind of mitigation measures which are expressed during the COP24 there are certain legitimate concerns which is expressed by India like an estimated of only 1.2 tons of carbon dioxide per capita is released by India and it is far below the global average of 4.2 tons per capita. So what they are mentioning here is the developed countries which already have exploited the resources and emitted more should now take the responsibility and they should focus more in order to cut the greenhouse gases than the developing countries which are still in the exploitation stage. So this is what put forward by India and you can see it in the data itself. We are not even reaching the global average of emission of CO2 and one more thing expressed by all the nations is, especially the smaller nations is, the prospect of increase in frequency of extreme weather events as well as the sea level rise in this warming world is not going to affect any kind of larger countries but it is going to affect the smaller islands and it allows little room for complacency. That means obviously they are not going to get satisfied with this kind of emission targets. So they want more action. So our focus should be like to achieve a paradigm shift that actually slow down the addition of new sources of carbon emissions there should be no new sources of carbon emissions and we have to make use of this as an opportunity to bring major sectors especially the energy production building agriculture and transport on board and thereby we can make changes to regulations to all these sectors that favor environment friendly alternatives so if you see in case of china they already actually has taken the lead in advancing the electric mobility. They shift their focus to electric mobility. And if you see in case of US, the individual states and cities, they are way ahead of national governments in terms of reducing their carbon footprint. So we have to follow the same line. And a cleanup in India is the need of the art to help meet the emission commitments as well as to remove the blanket of air pollution that is suffocating the entire cities. So the next article is Centre Drafts Child Protection Policy. So the news here is the Centre on Wednesday released a draft of a new national child protection policy which includes a declaration signed by all the employees of institutions who agrees to ensure the safety of the children of our nation. So who actually doing this in the sense the Ministry of Women and Child Development, they have uploaded the draft and has invited the comments from the stakeholders until Jan 4 in their website. 
so why we are focusing on children in the sense because india is a young nation and children constitute nearly 39% of our country's population according to the census 2011 so obviously what we are going to do them for today is determining the phase substance and character of our national progress in the future so this will be the first of its kind policy dedicated to the protection of children which is an area until now was only a part of broader national child policy of 2013 so it is now completely focused so who does the policy applies to means the policy will apply to all the institutions organizations including both the corporate and media house as well as the government and the private sector so all these people are coming under the ambit of this new draft child protection policy so what are the draft policy recommendations means these four are the policy recommendations first one is all organization in order to ensure the zero tolerance of child abuse and exploitation they must have a code of conduct and second major recommendation is it requires the organization to lay down the employees so the second major recommendation is all the organization should emphasize that employees don't use any kind of language or behavior that is inappropriate or harassing or abusing the children and the third one is institution should also designate a staff member to ensure that the protection of children as well as to report any kind of abuse to that particular member and if at all these all are violated then they must create an awareness in order to report about the abuse to the helpline number 1098 or police or to a child welfare committee so these are the draft policy recommendation so any policy has four aspects creating awareness prevention reporting and responding so this draft policy is not covering all the aspects so it need to build upon more so this is what put forward in this article so the next article is center urged to bring back restricted area permits in six andaman and nicobar islands so the news here is the national commission for scheduled tribes asked the center government to reintroduce restricted area permit for six islands of andaman and nicobar which was already relaxed a certain months before why because those six islands of andaman and nicobar islands are occupied by particularly vulnerable tribes so what is this restricted area permit means it was notified this restricted area permit was notified under foreigners restricted areas order of 1963 and as per this restricted area permit the foreign nationals are not normally allowed to visit those protected and restricted areas unless government is satisfied that there are extraordinary reason for them to justify their visit so why they are doing this in the sense in order to preserve or conserve the tribal people and their practices without mixing with the mainstream people or mainstream culture so this national commission for scheduled tribe so what the news here is now they want this six island to be again put under this restricted area permit okay so now in this context we are going to see what this ncst means national commission for scheduled tribe it is an constitutional body and it was established through constitution 89th amendment act in 2003 so earlier it was national commission for scheduled caste and scheduled tribes and in the year 2003 under 89th amendment act only they bifurcate this into national commission for scheduled caste and national commission for scheduled tribe and this tribe is under 338a and caste is for under article 338 so why this ncst in the sense in order to oversee the implementation of safeguards provided to the scheduled tribe under the constitution so now the news here is this national commission has actually sought the reimposition of restricted area permit in six islands which are inhabited by the particularly vulnerable tribes like andamanese jarwas sentinelis onges and somphans so these five people are actually inhabited in strait island middle and south andaman island north sentinel island and little andaman and great nicobar so they actually wanted to include these six island again into that restricted area permit So the next article is PM Asha. So we all knew that the government has already announced an increase in MSP for the karif crops by 1.5 times the cost of production. But increasing MSP alone is not actually adequate, and it is very important that the farmer should actually get the benefit of such announced MSP. 
So in order to ensure the benefit reaching the farmer only, this PM Asha Yojana come into force. So this scheme actually is to ensure the minimum support price benefit actually reaching the farmers. So it aimed at ensuring the remunerative prices of the produce to the farmers as announced in the union budget of 2018. And it is expected that increase in MSP will be translated to farmers income by means of robust procurement mechanism in coordination with the state government. So how they are going to achieve this in the sense by means of robust procurement mechanism. So what is that mechanism means? These three. First one is the price support scheme. So as per the price support scheme, the physical procurement of three things. One is the pulses, oil seeds and the copra. And it will be done by the central nodal agencies directly. So they are going to physically procure these items along with the help of the state governments. Okay. So at states and district level, the National Agriculture Federation and Food Corporation of India will take up this procurement process. So whatever the procurement expenditure and losses incurred during that process, it will be borne completely by the central government. So this is price support scheme. The second one is the price deficiency payment scheme. As the name indicates, the deficient money is paid by the central government to the farmers directly. In the sense, the farmers can sell their produce to the market at certain price and the difference between that price and the MSP will be given by the central government to the farmer into their registered bank account directly. So it actually covers all the oil seeds for which the MSP is notified and it doesn't involve any kind of physical procurement by the central government as the farmer directly sell it to the market. The difference amount is alone paid by the central government. The third one is pilot of private procurement and stockist scheme. So as the name indicates, the private is going to procure the products from the agri mandis where the farmers is actually storing the or selling their produce. Okay. So the selected private agency is going to procure the commodity at the rate of MSP in the notified mandis or markets during the notified period from the registered farmers. So it is also applicable only for the oil seeds. So it is not uh, done in a full fledged way, rather it is done in a pilot basis in selected districts. So these three schemes are under this PM ASHA, thereby it can ensure the remunerative prices to the farmers. So the next article is National e Vidan Application Project. So we all knew that our government is focusing on digital India. That means we want to make everything digital with the help of technology. And there are nine pillars of Digital India. So these are the nine pillars. So one of the pillar is e-governance. That means reforming the government and its governance project through technology. So this is what e-governance means. So in order to achieve this e-governance only, this e Vidan application project came into effect. So what this e Vidan application project actually aims is a paperless assembly or an electronic assembly, which is a concept involving of electronic means to facilitate the work of the assembly. So this electronic assembly enables the automation of entire lawmaking process in parliament as well as in the state legislative assembly. Thereby we can track the decisions and documents online and we can share the information among all the states as well as the central government. So if you see this kind of paperless assembly or electronic assembly was first leveraged at Himachal Pradesh that is Himachal Pradesh is already the first digital legislature of our country and this e Vidan application is also aimed to bring all the legislatures of our country together in one single platform thereby creating a massive data repository without having the complexity of multiple applications so it is a single database having all the information about the lawmaking process of our entire country. So the Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs is the nodal ministry which is responsible for the implementation of such electronic assembly in all the 31 states as well as the union territories. So this uh, e Vidan project is a centrally sponsored scheme where 60% of fund is provided by the central government and 40 is by the state government normally and in case of northeastern hilly states 90-10 is the ratio and for union territories entire money is funded by the central government. So the technical support for such implementation is provided by the METI. 
So the next article is focused attention for development of northeastern region. So our Prime Minister recently said like North East can be the new engine of a country's growth. So in order to realize the potential of the northeastern state what we have to do is we have to identify the various constraints on the way of accelerated inclusive and sustainable economic growth of northeastern region so we have to first identify the constraint and we have to recommend suitable solutions or the interventions for addressing such constraints so in order to do all these things the niti forum has been established by our central government to focus mainly on the northeastern region so this Niti Forum will be co-chaired by the Vice Chairman of Niti Ayo and the Minister of State of Ministry of Development of Northeastern Region. And one more thing to empower the Northeastern Region is this National Bamboo Mission. Nearly 60% of our country's bamboo production is grown in this Northeastern Region alone. Though it is having this much potential, it is not receiving the deserved attention until now so in order to tackle that only this national bamboo mission has been established under the finance ministry and it has an allocation of a budget of 1200 crores so by means of this we can provide the livelihood as well as the employment opportunities especially to the northeastern people so similar other projects in order to ensure the development of the northeastern region are the first one is india's first national sports university is in manipur in order to encourage the sports in the northeastern region an interministerial committee on medicinal and aromatic plants was set up for the northeastern region especially because they are a mostly forest dominated region and approval for setting up of an exclusive brahmaputra study center at guwahati university in assam is also done there and one more thing is northeast special infrastructure scheme which is under the donor ministry is also providing the financial assistance for the physical infrastructure development which are related to water supply power generation etc especially in the northeastern region so these are the vision of this northeastern ministries project in order to accelerate the development in the northeastern region so the last article is creation of fidf fund which is fisheries and aquaculture infrastructure development fund so our government is actually focusing on doubling of the farmers income by 2022 so if we really want to achieve this doubling of farmers income by 2022 we should not only focus on especially or exclusively on agriculture but we should also focus on the allied activities because we all knew that agriculture is a seasonal employment obviously during the non-seasonal time the farmers are going to focus on the non-allied activities of the agriculture so if you are going to provide adequate facilities to allied activities also then only it actually helps the farmers to double their income within the year 2022 so india's fish production is estimated at around 12 million tons annually and it has become the second largest fish producing and aquaculture industry in the world and in terms of aquaculture alone we are second to china with a global share of six percent of global aquaculture so keeping all these things in mind only the government has actually brought this FIDF fund which is a fisheries and aquaculture fund and it is a 7500 corpus fund in order to augment the fish production to achieve the target of 15 million ton by 2020 which is under the blue revolution thereby we can increase the employment opportunities to over 9.5 lakh fishers and fishermen and other entrepreneurs in the fishing and allied activities so by by doing all these things we can attract more and more private investment in both the creation as well as in the management of the fisheries infrastructure facilities so in order to implement this fidf fund we are having nodal loaning entities so this nodal loaning entities are the one who, which is responsible for raising the fund and it is being dispersed to the respective people or the companies or the individuals by the nabad and the national cooperatives development corporation and the scheduled banks so rather focusing only on agriculture if we focus on allied activities also then we can easily achieve the target of doubling of the farmers income so this is what mentioned in this article